Siapa yang mau buka? Mulai ya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello everyone. We are from group 2, Basic Analysis of Drama. And the member is Dimas Saputra, Lukman Akbar Maulana, Nabila Aulia, and myself, Yogin Fajar Santosa. And now and I will I will describe about feedback from the audience to the stage. In actors' memoirs, the homogeneity of an audience reaction is often described in terms of an intuitive rhythmic form of synchronization between actor and audience. These memoirs also contain frequent references to the effect of the audience reaction on the production itself. That is, on the way it carries the actor, improves his performance, stimulates him into spontaneous improvisation, or conversely, and nervous or inhibits him. This feedback effect also explains why a performance of even the most carefully rehearsed production is different to the one before, depending on the particular audience involved and why each performance is unique and unrepeatable. In a way, the technically reproducible dramatic text of films. Then, Sending and receiving information. 3.1, information in internal and external communication system. On one of the difficulties involved in analyzing the ways information is transmitted in dramatic text results from the embedding of the internal communication system in the external system that we refer to in the chapter one. Generally speaking, the informational value of a single verbal or a non-verbal signal changes according to whether it is evaluated within the framework of the internal or the external communication system. An example of this would be a particular interior decor presented on the stage. Normally, this is of the title informational value to the figures acting within it, since It is merely a part of their familiar, automatically perceived environment. <clears throat> Then, advanced information and the audience horizon of expectation. 3.21, the expectation associated with genre and the titles as advanced information. On the basis of socially received knowledge and experience and certain familiarity, With the convention of dramatic text, the receivers of a dramatic text bring information to bear on a performance that is inaccessible to the fictional protagonist. On the most general, and thus historically the least variable level, this refers to the divergence between the audience awareness of the fictionality of what is presented on the one hand and the fictional figure's awareness of reality <clears throat> on the other. This divergence is always present in latent form and may become more explicit if the fictional figures present their own reality, as illusory by invoking the image of the theater. Then, thematic advanced information. Advanced on Information of this kind is also conveyed in the frequent in textual references in dramatic text to mythical or historical events that the dramatist can safely assume are familiar to his or her intended audience. The advanced information contained in the title is primarily as of a thematic nature, so long as it does not naturally announce the genre itself. Then, the interrelationship of verbal and non-verbal information. The matrix of possible relationship. In the previous section on the relationship between the advanced information, 
available to the receivers and the transmission of information it was not deemed necessary to decipher the codes and channels used to transmit that information. Then identity. From the audience point of view, the existence of identity means that in the majority of dramatic text, <clears throat> familiarity with the primary text is sufficient in itself to ensure a relationable measure of comprehension. The more this relationship predominates, the more redundant non-verbally transmit information becomes in comparison with the verbal primary text. Information that has already been mediated verbally is merely translated into the medium of mime and gesture and into the physical immediacy of the stage. Of course, it is rare that identity this redundant doubling up of verbal and non-verbal information. And that's all that I can describe about my chapter and the other explanation will be presented by the next presenter. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Yagin. Now, uh, I would like to continue the material still in the interrelationship in the verbal and nonverbal um, communications. Now, as complementary, um, when the things are complementary by definition, they combine in such a way that they support or reinforce each other. I think all of you has already know what means of the verbal and verbal communications. Verbal is um, delivery by spoken and nonverbal is by our body language. So what is the meaning of the complementary in verbal and nonverbal communications? Um, I just guessing that um, it, it can be called complementary if uh, the body language comfort, uh, comports with the spoken words. Uh, look at the example. <clears throat> um, it is in, in our Indonesian culture, when you say yes, if you are saying yes, and your head is nodding up and down like this, so it, uh, your verbal and nonverbal communication, it can be called complementary. But uh, if your head is going from side to side, like, um, like swinging door, uh, Verbal and non-verbal is uncomplementary or not complementary. Okay, next. No, um, discrepancy. By discrepancy, we do not just mean any contradictions that might occur between a character's word at his or her actions, since uh, this can often be understood psychologically and thus be resolved by the receiver or the audience. It differs with um, complementary. Uh, so just look at the example. Uh, Strogon, I'm going, but he doesn't move. Uh, if he move, it can be called, un, uh, it can be called um, complementary, but it's not complementary. And the next, uh, well, shall we go? Yes, let's go. They do not move still. Well, shall we go? Yes, let's go, but they do not move. Uh, <clears throat> but it still have the meaning and the audience have to um, knowing in the psychological, in the psychological, in the psychologic um, aspect when uh, want to get to know what, uh, why the person or the character doesn't move. Okay, next. Okay, 3.4, level of awareness in the dramatic figures and the audience. Um, this different awareness describes the unequal distribution of knowledge and information among various characters in drama as well, as in the relationship between dramatic characteristic and the audience. Of, uh, <clears throat> it's like what I have said before, uh, this point is information not be clearly for somebody, but uh, the audience have to aware about the meaning of every act, every words that the person um, doing at the drama. So yeah, the information unclearly, but still have, but we have to 
thinking more, thinking harder to know that. Next. <clears throat> okay, so for your audience awareness, uh, the audience is able to recognize the discrepancies between the levels of awareness in the in the individual dramatic figures. Um, have you ever watched um, the drama or theater or maybe movie in cinema? Um, you already know the ending of the, even the movie or the drama uh, still going. Yeah, for example, the audience might know Oedipus is the or tragic ending before Oedipus himself does. And the next example is um, another, another example <clears throat> in a film, uh, maybe when the audience know uh, the killer is hiding in the closet while the protagonist does not. So the audience able to recognize the discrepancies between the awareness and the individual dramatic figure. Next. Okay, for inferior audience awareness, as a dominating factor in dramatic text, inferior audience awareness is less common than the reverse. In fact, it does not even um, necessarily uh, predominate in drama that use an analytical technique. So call this um, Oedipus the king, for example, with killer uh, regarded as an ideal model for tragic um, analysis 14 initiates the audience into the central secret of the events leading up to the play very early on. In addition to any advanced uh, knowledge the audience might have of the myth. Next. Okay, the last one in my material about the congruent awareness. The congruent awareness of audience and dramatic figures really represent a borderline case of discrepant awareness in which the element of uh, discrepancy is zero. So that's all from me. I'm sorry for making a mistake. Uh, the next match shall be presented for the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, uh, the, next, the next material is about the perspective structure of dramatic text. Figure's perspective versus the reception perspective intended by the author. Uh, uh, the, rel the relationship between figures and audience awareness that we analyzed uh, in the previous section is only one particular dimension of the overall context of the pers perspective structure, or the perspective from which uh, dramatic figures observe the action and the perspectival nuances he can spark it are only partially conditioned by the level of advanced information the figures has had access to. Uh, the various figures' perspective are coordinate on, on equal terms, that is, they pose the same degree of fictionality and, in principle, have the same degree of validity for the receiver. Um, from the outset, all of the figures' perspective within the framework of the accepted principle of perspectivity are of equal importance in constituting the authorially intended reception perspective. Next. And the next is the hierarchical arrangement of figure perspective. Of course, as an idealized model, the absolute drama has no normative validity. In fact, there are many periods in the history of drama in which not a single play was written that was characterized by the immediate superimposition of internal and external communication system. Well, one example of the non-ironic application of a superordinate figure's perspective is the singer in Brest, the Caucasian shock circle, whose function is to provide a narrative transition from one episode to the next and add his own reflective commentary on the parable presented on stage. Next. Uh, and the next is techniques used to control and coordinate the perspective. We should now like to determine how the audience, how the audience in the in the external communication system is able to recreate the authorially attended reception perspective from the range of individual figures' perspective, or seen from the production point of view. What channels are used by the author to influence the constitution of this perspective in this receiver? 
This question is especially pertinent in the case of absolute dramatic text in which the author completely dispenses with the mediating uh, figure perspective. Nevertheless, it may also be asked of texts that have a hierarchical patterns of figure perspective since there is ultimately no reason why the superordinate mediating character perspective should be accepted as the ultimate authority. Next. And next is a perspectival information. First, it should be remembered that the transmission of, inter of information in dramatic text is not received to the verb of primary text alone. Uh, the rest, what is known as non verbal information, is transmitted direct to the audience and remains completely independent of the various figure perspective. Uh, the juxtaposition of a uh, perspectively transmit information and information transmit via a figure perspective uh, enables the receiver to recognize an utterance as perspectively distort if it deviates from the nonverbal information and then allows him to allows him or her to make allowance for it in the intended reception perspective. There is a particularly vivid example of the uh, of this in uh, a comedy of errors in the in the scene where Adriana described her husband as a characterization of Antipolis physical appearance. This description is clearly reviewed by the visual information company uh, perspectively during his early appearance in the play. The audience conclude therefore uh, that this description is perspectively extremely distorted. The audience is able to understand the way Adrian's perspective, restricted from the outset by her jealousy and self ripness is influenced by the games of deception and mistaken identity to such an extent that her view of her husband becomes totally distorted. The audience is thus able to contrast Adriana's view with its own more sophisticated and balanced interpretation of Antipolis. Next. And the last one is the selection of figures perspective. In the previous section, we concern we concern on control and coordination techniques uh, that are applied to one individual perspective in isolation. As we have seen, uh, however, the primary text of a drama is usually constructed uh, as a collection of different perspectives. From the way this collection is structured, it is possible to deduce, deduce an additional implicit control technique that can be used in the constitution of the authorially intended perception perspective. Following linguistic analytical practice, we should now like to examine the structure of this collection uh, of this collection of figure perspective according to two criteria, the paradigmatic aspect associated with the selection and the syntagmatic aspect associated with combination. Okay, that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nabila. And next, we will discuss about the types of perspective structure. It is an analysis of the relationships between the pattern of figure perspectives on the other hand and the outer authori author authorially intended reception perspective on the other. Enables us to construct three ide idealized models for the perspective structure of dramatic text. The first one is a perspective structure. Second one is closed perspective structure, and the third one is perspective open perspective structure. Next, please. The types of perspective structure. It is an extreme form of drama in which the principal the principle of absolute autonomy towards both author and audience, and thus also the separation of the external and internal communication system is abolished. The result is a text in which the author used the utterances of the figures to express his own conviction and in which, in turn, the figures serve as mouthpieces for the author by addressing the audience. In terms of verbal communication, the communication model for this kind of text is identical to that for expository text. The various figures' perspectives are share and reinforce the orientation of the intended reception perspective. They run parallel to it. 
show no form of perspective uh, perspectival deviation from it and are absorbed into it. This idealized model of an a perspectival structure is not merely a product of theoretical speculation and there are a number of historical dramatic forms that go some considerable way in approaching it. Next, please. A close perspective structure. In dramas with a close perspective call structure, the line of convergence linking the various contrasting and corresponding figure perspectives, sample, the authority intended perception perspective must be imagined in the reverse, in the receivers themselves. As such, this kind of drama may be distinguished from one with a perspective call structure by the way it eschews ready for solutions and activates or challenge the receiver's power of moral judgment. Thus, inherent in this structural distinction, there's also an implicit functional one. Direct didaxis gives way to indirect mode of meditation, which engage the receiver in the process of discovering the truth and in consulting and in constituting the intended reception perspective. The shifting perspectives enable to the receiver to see the problem from different angles and thus to create a complex multidimensional image of it. Next, please. And the last one is open perspective structure. In place with an open perspective structure, on the other hand, there is no single line of convergence that might draw all this perspective together. The relationship between the figure perspective remain unclear, either because all control signals are omitted or because those that are not contradict one another. The intended perception perspective thus remains uncertain or ambivalent. The absence of any program solution is therefore complete. Next, please. And we're going to discuss about epic communication structures in drama. There are two types of epic structures. The first one is epic tendencies in drama and technique of epic communication. The epic tendencies in drama are divided by three. There is the abolition of finality, the abolition of concentration, and the abolition of dramatic autonomy. And the techniques of epic communication are divided into five types. The outer as epic narrator, the introduction of epic elements by figures outside the action, the introduction of epic elements by figures inside the action, nonverbal epic tendencies, and the repertoire of epic technique. Next, please. Now we will discuss about the epic tendencies in, in drama first. The ablation of finality, it means the epic quality of a work rests in the independence of its part and its dramatic quality in its finality. Example, the degree to which these parts focus on the ending. The ablation of, of concentration means seen from this perspective, the epic tendency in drama may be described as the attempt to present reality on stage in its totality, together with all its minuscule details. And the last one is the abolition of dramatic autonomy. The presence of a mediate, mediating communication system in narrative texts and its absence in dramatic texts. Next. And the last one is techniques of epic communication. The outer as epic narrators include the introduction of epic elements by figures outside the action and the introduction of epic elements by figures inside the action is a narrative and descriptive text which preimpose an interpretative perspective on the dramatic presentation that follows it. 
I think that's all for me. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, and that's all the material explanation from group two. Thank you for watching, everyone, and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.